I'd like to thank Paul very much for inviting me here and giving me the chance to talk to you all, and thank you all for coming. I'd say that science is at its best when it's describing and rationalising how nature works. When objects and events from nature can be isolated, studied in the lab, by experiments that are repeatable, then science does an excellent job. So when it comes to understanding how cells, the basic elements of life, work, how they work, then science is wonderful and it's made amazing progress and we understand and we all admire the work that the biochemists have done in, uh, in this area. But historical science is a completely different ballpark. When attempting to explain unique events from the past that can't be taken into the laboratory, then the element of subjectivity becomes very large. Origin, event, origin events can't be studied in the laboratory. The models that are developed depend critically on the assumptions that go into them. And these are often strongly influenced by ideology. Science has no valid right to supremacy in these areas. Of course, we can listen to what the scientists have to say, but they have no automatic right to supremacy in these areas. We as individuals, whether we have a scientific training or not, are perfectly entitled to either accept or reject their conclusions in this area. So I think it's a great pity when popular scientists, influential scientists like Richard Dawkins, claim that those who reject the molecules to man scenario are ignorant, stupid, insane or wicked. I put on that slide where he made that quotate, quotation. Now many people have picked up on his views and uh, echo his remarks. Now I'm one who does reject that molecules to man scenario. I do reject it. So you might be mentally sticking Dawkins' label on me, ignorant, stupid, etc., etc. That's why my next slide shows my qualifications in a bit more detail than I would normally do. You can see that I have two doctors. I'm not trying to boast here. I just want you to know I'm not ignorant, stupid or wicked. I've got two doctorates. I'm a professor of chemistry at St Andrews University. I'm a chartered chemist and uh, I've been elected to fellowships of the Royal Society of Chemistry and the Royal Society right here in Edinburgh. Now, undoubtedly, I am ignorant of some things. I'm not a biologist, for example. But I can't be described as stupid or insane, and I think I deserve a fair hearing. That's all I'm asking this evening, a fair hearing. I agree with the Nobel laureate, Richard Feynman, the physicist, when he said, I believe that a scientist looking at non-scientific problems is just as dumb as the next guy. Now, we're thinking this evening about origin of life. What is life, first of all? Perhaps you might agree with Oscar Wilde that life is far too important a thing ever to sort, talk seriously about. In that case, we're all wasting our time coming here this evening and I'm wasting my time talking to you. Maybe it's all a mistake. But surely, when Lang says that life is a sexually transmitted disease, surely he's being far too pessimistic. Perhaps you see the force of Robert Heinlein's remark that the supreme irony of life is that hardly, one, hardly anyone gets out of it alive. True enough. <coughs> pessimistic again, though. A much more optimistic note was struck by Job when he said, the spirit of God has made me, the breath of the Almighty gives me life. And St. John, quoting the words of Jesus, said, I am the way, the truth and the life, gives a much more optimistic slant to the whole business. Now the point that I'm trying to make here is that inevitably, origin of life ideas have strong philosophical and religious implications. Whether you're an atheist, an agnostic, a Christian, whatever, what you believe about origins 
is going to strongly influence how you relate to other people, how you lead your own life. People become very emotionally involved. It's difficult to stay cool. However, I've heard that it's said that education is the ability to listen to almost anything without losing your temper. I don't know if you agree with that, but we're just going to see this evening how well educated you all are. Now, there is some scientific controversy over exactly what is alive and what isn't alive. Most will agree, most scientists will agree that these characteristics that I put up here are typical of life. For example, there'll be organization. A living thing is composed of cells, one or more. The cells themselves are carefully organized, as we'll see in a minute. Metabolism. Consumption of energy by converting non-living material into cellular components. Adaptation, the ability to change over a period of time. Response to stimuli, that might mean contraction of a unicellular thing. Or motion, a bacterium moving along. Or a plant turning towards the sun, some kind of response then probably the most characteristic thing of life is reproduction. Living things reproduce themselves. Cells may divide to give you two, but usually the term is applied to the production of a new individual. Now that means viruses, and uh, there's an X-ray structure of a virus, they're not alive because they can't reproduce themselves without help from a host. On the other hand, bacteria, and here's some soil bacteria, are alive because they can reproduce themselves independently. Now, in the quest for origin of life, it's helpful to know what's the smallest living cell? What is the very smallest that's known? And, um, whoops, too far... Carsonella rudi was reported to be the smallest living cell. It has about 160,000 base pairs of DNA in its genome. However, this particular bacteria lives inside a leaf-munching insect called a psyllid. You can see that psyllid over there. And Carsonella doesn't have quite enough enzymes to survive on its own. So it can't survive on reproduce on its own. So really, the smallest living thing is this bacteria, Mycoplasma genitalium. It lives in the genital and respiratory tracts of primates. It's the smallest free-living bacterium, and it has a genome consisting of about 580,000 base pairs. Now, that's quite a lot of base pairs, quite a lot, really. So these are the smallest organisms that can reproduce by themselves. Let's take a quick look inside. This isn't actually a bacterial cell, but it was such a pretty picture that I picked it out anyway. Um, a cell is packed with organization. Um, there'll be a nucleus, not inside a bacterial cell, but many cells have a nucleus with its own nuclear membrane, inside which is the DNA. There are ribosomes, usually particularly concentrated on this endoplasmic reticulum. You see these little black dots. Those are where proteins and enzymes are made. Oh, there are Golgi apparatuses, cytoskeleton. Here's some smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Here are the mitochondria where ATP is synthesized and there are various other um, organelles inside the cell. It's all surrounded by the cell membrane. Each of these organelles is itself quite complex. And uh, here's the ribosome structure, for example. picture of it on the, on the left here. This is the whole thing. These little sort of worms and wires that you see here are the protein chains together with a lot of DNA. There are two units, and here is the larger left-hand unit here rotating so that you can get a better idea of its structure. So this is the ribosome where proteins and enzymes are synthesized. The cell membrane is quite complex as well. 
It consists of a lipid bilayer. See, there's an upper layer and a lower layer. There are two pictures here, so here's another artist's impression. Upper layer here, lower layer here. And then there are some proteins. Some of them are just floating in it. Some of them pass right through the membrane. Some of them have channels in them that let ions through, protons or um, other proteins come through. Many of them are topped with carbohydrates that uh, are there to recognize other things that approach the cell. So it's quite a complex structure. Now I want to focus down on four types of large molecules that are key cell components. First there are the lipids made of fatty acids. Then there are carbohydrates, which are made up of sugars. The two most important ones that I want to focus on are the proteins, which are made up of amino acids, and the nucleic acids, which are made up of nucleotides. So proteins and enzymes, I'm going to use the two terms practically interchangeably, because an enzyme is a type of protein. So most of the important components in the cell, the cell wall itself, all those little organelles that I showed you, almost all of those have their structures based around proteins, carbohydrates, and the information carriers are the nucleic acids. Now proteins themselves are made from these amino acids. I don't want to blind you with chemistry this evening, so if you're not familiar with chemical structures, don't worry, just relax. There's only one or two things that I want you to pick up on here. I love chemistry myself, so I, I like to use the structures, but don't worry if you're, uh, if you're lost by these kind of pictures. Now, these are, there are five amino acids here. Notice they all have this NH2 at one end, NH2, and then they've got this carboxylate group at the other, and then they have a different side chain. There isn't one there. There's this side chain here, this one here, a sulfur side chain here, an amino side chain here. So there are five different amino acids there, and they link together in a chain to form a protein. So those five there might link up to give this little protein here called a pentapeptide. So we have glycine, alanine, phenylalanine, cysteine, and lysine, these five amino acids, linked together in a chain. The backbone is made from the amine, amine, and acid bits. That's the peptide. And then these side chains are sticking out from the backbone. Now, it doesn't stay in that linear way. Once it's assembled like that, once the chain is assembled, it folds itself up into a particular shape, like the shape that I showed you a minute ago, or like this one here. This is insulin, which has got 51 amino acids in its chain. Now, all the atoms are shown here, so it looks pretty complicated. So it's usual to simplify the structure just by showing ribbons and chains like this and other, um, other units. So this is a small um, protein, insulin. Notice there are sort of helical bits to the structure, some alpha helices here, and uh, here's a, a, uh, another small um, protein here called a fluorinase, which happens to have been studied in my department. That's why I put it up there. You can see quite a complicated structure, but not too bad, really. Um, Many important proteins in cells are much larger than this. These are just two small ones that I've um, shown, so I don't blind you with too much science, because I know not all of you are scientists. And notice the sequence that the amino acids link in is the key thing. They have to link in a particular sequence, otherwise the protein will not fold into the proper shape, and then it won't be able to fulfill its task in the cell. Now, it's exactly the same with RNA or DNA, the nucleic acids. Um, nucleic acids are made of what are called nucleotides. Again, don't worry about the chemistry if you're not familiar with it. Here's a typical nucleotide. It's a sugar and a phosphate, and then there's a base. This particular one is adenine, and there are four bases altogether, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil, which 
link at that point to give four different nucleotides. And these nucleotides string together, again, in a chain, one after the other. So here's a chain, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar chain with the base sticking out like this, sticking out. Now, usually, one um, nucleic acid chain links to another nucleic acid chain by hydrogen bonds, and then the two twist up into the famous double helix, which is shown here. But the basic structure is just a long sequence of these four nucleotides, one after another, after another, after another. Now, in all living things, in all living cells, proteins and nucleic acids are related to one another by the so-called genetic code. The order of amino acids in the protein corresponds to the order of bases in the nucleic acid. And the DNA carries the information to build all the proteins, all the enzymes in the cell, in the living system. The information is there in the DNA, and it's translated by the code translation machinery, which involves in a living cell over a hundred special proteins. At the translation site, at the site of um, protein building, that's the ribosome that I showed you a few minutes ago, the sequence is recognized and the amino acids are assembled into the particular order that's needed for that enzyme or that protein. Now, this order is, is important. That, that's what I want you to get from this. A cell will contain several thousand different proteins and enzymes, each having a specific order of amino acids. Now, when a cell divides, a copy of the DNA passes to the next generation. So, all the information needed to build these protein chains is there in that copy of DNA and the new cell translation machinery, the new code translation machinery can then read off and build all the proteins that are needed for the new cell. And so it goes on from generation to generation. The information is in the DNA, it's passed to the next generation, new uh, creature, new cell, new whatever is built from that information. Now let's think about an origin of life scenario. The first living organism. There would be no DNA to copy. No enzyme-based cell translation machinery either. So which came first, the enzymes or the DNA? Been much debated. Some scientists think one, some think the other. Some think you've got to have both, including Nobel Prize winner Manfred Eigen. Recently, the idea that RNA came first has taken hold. It's become fashionable, and people talk about the RNA world. Now, for the sake of argument, let's imagine that there is a primordial soup on the Earth containing a mixture of amino acids and nucleotides, and that these react together. The amino acids are producing enzymes or proteins, and the nucleotides are producing lengths of RNA. We'll concentrate on RNA, although RNA and DNA are very similar. Now, notice this has got to take place by purely random chemical transformations. There can't be any template copying here. There's no information, there's no DNA to copy. It's got to happen in a random chemical way, the normal way that chemical reactions take place, random. How is it that just the right enzymes or just the right RNA fragments could appear, the right ones that could start replication or could start catalyzing the right reaction. How could just the right ones appear? Let's just think about... Um, I think I must have slipped through one there. Nope, I didn't. Let's just think about amino acids. We'll start with them. Randomly coupling in the normal chemical way. So we've got three amino acids, say glycine, alanine, and phenylalanine, and they couple together. Now they could couple in this order, glycine, alanine, phenylalanine, or we could have glycine, then the phenylalanine, and then the alanine. 
Or we could have the alanine first and then the glycine and phenylalanine, or those two could switch over. Or we could have the phenylalanine first and these two, or the phenylalanine first and those in the reverse order. So there are six possible small uh, chains from three amino acids, six possible chains. Now suppose we've got four amino acids in our soup, this four, it's easy to show that there are now 24 different chains that could be produced. And in a random chemical mixture, we'd expect all 24 to be formed with equal probability. If there are five amino acids present, random coupling, there are 120 different proton chains. And if coupling really is random, all 120 should be made. It's amazing how rapidly the number of possibilities escalates. Now, I've put on a graph here. Here's the number of amino acids that are available or, or that are in the chain. And here is the possible number of sequences. Now, I talked about uh, three, four, and five. But when you get to eight amino acids in a chain, already the number of possible chains is nearly 50,000 possible chains. That's quite a large number. And uh, when you reach 10 amino acids in the chain, selected from the 22 amino acids that take part in biological processes, then uh, the number of possible chains zooms up to 10 to the power 13. And uh, if you have 100 amino acids in the chain, or 250 in the chain, and this is sort of a typical length for a, a normal cell protein, then the number of possible sequences that could be formed in a random chemical system is 10 to the power 130, or for 250, 10 to the power 325. Um, if you had 1,000 in the chain, and that's by no means a, a huge protein, it would be 10 to the power 1,301. Now, um, these are very big numbers, uh, enormously big numbers. Um, the chance of forming the right protein, that's a protein that can do a specific job that's needed to start replication going, reproduction going, needed to start the origin of life process. The chance of finding 100 amino acids long is one chance in 10 to the 130. Now to put this in context, if you count up all the atoms in the entire known universe, now I'm talking here about all the planets, all the stars, all the solar systems, all the galaxies, all the clusters of galaxies, all the superclusters of galaxies, the entire known universe, count up all the atoms, you get a number somewhere between 10 to the power 80 and 10 to the power 100. I hope that gives you some idea of the enormous, stupendous odds there are against just the right set of proteins that you need for cell formation to form by a random process. Um, what's your chance of winning the lottery? Maybe one in a million, maybe one in ten, uh, sorry, one in ten in a billion, or maybe one in ten billion, something like that. That's um, one in about 10 to the power 9 or 10 to the power 10, somewhere like that. Now, people are willing to stake their earnings on those sort of odds, but um, are you willing to really bet your belief system on odds of that sort of magnitude, one in 10 to the power 130? Now, the situation is very similar to this when it comes to nucleic acids or, or RNA, the RNA world. If we had a nucleotide chain of uh, 77 nucleotides long, that's typical for transfer RNA, then the number of possible sequences that could form in a random chemical situation is 10 to the power 46. Um, ribosomal RNA would have about 3,000. Um, that's 10 to the power 1,806. You see the stupendous numbers, transcomputable numbers that are here, and uh, bacterial DNA. Now, the figure I've got there is 30,000, but if you remember my smallest bacteria, 
um, the um, mycoplasma genitalium, that had 580,000 base pairs. So uh, it was a good deal bigger than that. The total number of possible sequences for 30,000 is, is 10 to the power 18,000 odd. These numbers are absolutely stupendous, and the chances against getting the right one are correspondingly minute. Um, in case you think um, that I've just made all this up, the data are taken from uh, articles by Hubert Jockey from Journal of Theoretical Biology, Calculation of the Probability of Spontaneous Biogenesis by Information Theory. So I put it there if you want to look it up. But the same kind of information can be found in a number of articles. Manfred Eigen, the, the uh, Nobel Prize winner, has a similar sets of figures in his review on self-replicating systems. Um, now, of course, scientists know perfectly well about these fantastically low odds. But they're hopeful that some way out of this impasse can be found. You know, not long after Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA and the genetic code was deciphered, it was suggested that there might be laws of chemical affinity which predisposed the amino acids to link up in the order that would be right for the genesis of life. Maybe there's something that predisposes them to come together in those particular orders that are needed for the enzymes inside cells. Now, um, many lab experiments to try and find the, this affinity have been carried out and uh, they uniformly come to the same conclusion that there is no such thing. Uh, there are some constraints on the way amino acids can link together, but generally speaking, the, um, any sequence can be produced in an origin of life type scenario in a, in a primordial soup. So amino acids or nucleotides can couple in any order and would do so. So these odds do have to be overcome somehow. Now the second possible way around the impasse is uh, given under number two there. Given enough time, anything can happen, right? A monkey on a typewriter can produce the entire works of Shakespeare given enough time. So here's a quote from George Wald, another Nobel Prize winner. Time is in fact the hero of the plot. The time with which we have to deal is of the order of two billion years. What we regard as impossible on the basis of human experience is meaningless here. Given enough time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, and the probable virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs the miracles. What about that then? I've put some figures on the, uh, the bottom there so you can see what kind of time is available and what kind of space is available. If we had a one meter thick layer covering the surface of the earth and uh, it was made up of proteins 10 kilodaltons in size, that's quite a small protein. So if the entire surface of the Earth was covered in a one meter thick layer, we could pack into that about 10 to the 41 uh, protein. Compare that with one chance in 10 to the 130. See there's about 90 orders of magnitude less. Um, if we had a primordial sloop, soup, one millimolar in proteins in all the oceans, there would be about 10 to the power 42 proteins of 10 kilodaltons size. If we packed the entire volume of the universe, and I'm talking about the entire universe here, with protein molecules, that's all the space, I'm not just talking about the surface of stars, I'm talking about the entire volume of the universe here. If we packed that with proteins, then about 10 to the power 103 proteins could get in there. Compare that with the figures that I was showing you. 10 to the power 130, 10 to the power 325. You see how small they are. You see, there just isn't enough space in the universe. And there isn't enough time either because, if you look at my last line there, 
the number of proteins of that size that would be produced by a one centimeter thick layer of cells covering the whole Earth's surface in 10 billion years. Suppose they were producing proteins at the maximum rate that cells produce proteins for 10 billion years, they could produce about 10 to the power 52 proteins in that time. And we've got to work through 10 to the power 130, 10 to the power 325 in order to find the right protein for starting replication or whatever. There isn't enough space, there isn't enough time. And uh, the whole thing is summed up rather nicely by Robert Shapiro, the improbability involved in generating even one bacterium, now we could replace that and say even one RNA, useful RNA sequence, is so large that it reduces all considerations of time and space to nothingness. Given such odds, the time until the black holes evaporate and the space to the ends of the universe would make no difference at all. We would be waiting for a miracle. Robert Shapiro, not a creationist, not even a Christian as far as I know. So the conclusion is that there isn't enough space, there isn't enough matter, particularly carbon, I'll come back to that, and there isn't enough time for spontaneous generation of a re self-replicating system. So what, th what did happen then? Is there some other way around this impasse that I'm talking about? Perhaps some selection mechanism was at work. This is the avenue down which most scientists are seeking a solution to the problem today. Now, notice first of all that Darwinian evolution in which natural selection operates on variants generated by random mutations cannot operate before a self-replicating organism appears you've got to be able to have reproduction already present before Darwinian evolution can occur. So this isn't a get out. So if you hear people talking about natural selection before the first living organism, it can't happen. Now usually about this point, scientists appeal to um, computational models of selection. And uh, the most famous of these is Dawkins' so-called weasel program. I can see some of you have heard of it. The amino acids in proteins can be represented by letters in the alphabet. And the same way that the amino acids are in strings, so letters are in strings to form words and phrases. And uh, Dawkins uh, wrote a program to... Um, see how, if you like, a monkey on a typewriter could uh, get the phrase, methinks it is like a weasel. That was his phrase, which has become quite uh, sort of popular. That's why, it's, why I call it his weasel program. Now, the, uh, the program selects randomly generated letters by means of this algorithm that he has written. And Dawkins' program reaches the desired phrase in only about 43 iterations, generations, so fairly quickly. And there are other similar programs which you can access on the web, which do it even more efficiently. So only 43 generations, it seems like the problem can be overcome. Until you think about it a little bit more carefully. Um, now Dawkins himself is careful to back away from saying that this program solves the enormous odds problem that I've uh, outlined to you because he knows that it doesn't. The algorithm that's programmed into the computer must know the final phrase. Methinks it is like a weasel. That has got to be programmed in. Then the algorithm compares the letters as they are selected, one after another. It compares the little phrases with this final phrase. Methinks it is like a, a weasel. And the closer they are to the final phrase, uh, the more, more selected they are. Now, of course, in a random chemical mixture, there's no way of knowing the final structure. If you know the final structure, then your problem's already solved. He's already, he's already uh, selected the answer. Yes? Not in, a random, not in a random chemical selection process. 
not before Darwinian evolution can take place. It can take place once living, living things are there and Darwinian evolution can take over, but not in a random chemical situation as for an origin of life scenario. Um, so intelligent design has to be put into the program to know the phrase in the same way you would have to know what RNA sequence was the effective one for this kind of selection to take place. Furthermore, you've got to have a selector. A selector is built into the program. It selects the letters as they're produced and compartmentalizes them, stores them, and then when another useful letter comes along, it adds it to the phrase. Again, there are no such systems in random chemical situation. They don't exist before the uh, advent of cells. Now, in spite of what I said, there are many scientists who believe that such selection mechanisms will eventually be discovered. They're living in the hopes that such selection mechanisms will be discovered eventually. To me, these computer programs are evidence that it takes design, intelligent input, to overcome the stupendous odds. I want to ask you a question. How gullible do you think you are? I was amused to read of a student at um, Eagle Rock Junior High School and he won first prize as a science fair. Just to um, illustrate, his project illustrated how conditioned we've become to junk science. And in his project he urged people to sign a petition asking for a ban on the chemical dihydrogen monoxide. And he told them that it can cause excessive sweating and vomiting. It's a major component of acid rain. It can cause severe burns in the gaseous state. Accidental inhalation can kill you. It contributes to erosion. It decreases the effectiveness of carburates. And, here's the clincher, it's been found in tumours of terminal cancer patients. Now he asked 50 people and 43 of them supported the idea of a ban on um, dihydrogen monoxide. Six people were undecided. One person knew that this chemical was water. I can hear there's, there's some there in the, in the audience. Water. Of course water causes sweating, or is present in sweating. Of course it's a component of acid rain. Of course it, steam can burn you. And uh, so on and so forth. We've become conditioned to junk science. But don't just accept the ideas that come at you from the junk scientists. You need to think everything through quite carefully. There's nothing out there that I'm aware of at the moment that uh, solves the problem of how the information needed for self-replication originated. There's a lot of research going on into chemical replicators that these models lack the complexity that are needed for a living system. And as they get more sophisticated, so they simply show the need for intelligence, human intelligence in this case, in order to design uh, such systems. In the last couple of decades, attention has switched to what I called the RNA world a minute ago. Certain RNA molecules have catalytic properties so they can act a bit like enzymes, but they can also carry information. So it seemed reasonable that ancient RNA molecules might have acted as the starting point for the origin of life. Now the RNA world depends on there being an abundance of nucleotides available so that they could combine together and form some particular RNA strand that would get the whole process going. Now nucleotides are made of um, the four bases, well, they're distinguished by the four bases that I showed you a few minutes ago. We imagine some sort of primordial soup. It doesn't have to be a soup, but let's imagine a primordial soup. It would have to be under an atmosphere containing no oxygen. If there's any oxygen in the atmosphere, then uh, degradative processes 
Oxidative degradation takes place very rapidly. Nucleotides degrade, almost all organic chemicals degrade very rapidly on a geological time scale. Most textbooks simply state that the original atmosphere must have been reducing or at least neutral, perhaps it was CO2. But how reasonable is this? On this slide, I've shown the abundances of the elements in the Earth's crust. Now, notice one thing. So here's the element across here, and here's the abundance as a percentage of the Earth's crust. Here's oxygen, and notice it's 47% of the Earth's crust. Nearly 50% of the Earth's crust, that's the solid surface of the Earth, is oxygen. Almost all rocks are oxides of metals, silicon, aluminium, iron, calcium, etc. They're all, or large proportion of them, are oxides. And it all adds up to about 47% of the surface of the earth, the crust of the earth. Um, silicon comes next. Notice hydrogen, the reducing element, is only 0.1%. And we're not surprised because hydrogen is a very light element, it rises to the surface of the atmosphere and escapes from the Earth's gravitational field. And carbon, there's not a huge lot of carbon in the surface of the Earth either. People don't realise that. It's not that abundant in the, in the crust of the Earth, just 0.1%. So oxygen is the most abundant element in the Earth's crust. Now oxygen is overwhelmingly abundant in the hydrosphere. That's mainly the sea, combined with hydrogen as water. So we're expected to believe that the primordial Earth had a crust, nearly 50% oxygen, a hydrosphere, enormously, overwhelmingly uh, oxygen present in that, and that's in contact with an atmosphere completely without oxygen in it. You know, thermodynamically, to a, to a chemist like me, thermodynamically that just does not make sense some oxygen would be sure to escape up into the atmosphere. Furthermore, if the atmosphere had been devoid of oxygen at some time, then there are processes, particularly ultraviolet, whoops, done the wrong one again, ultraviolet photolysis of water from the hydrosphere converts water into a mixture of oxygen and hydrogen. And the hydrogen then escapes from the Earth's gravitational field, leaving the oxygen behind. Now, some people say, well, this process might not have been very efficient on the primordial Earth. Direct observations from the Moon during the Apollo 16 mission revealed that substantial amounts of hydrogen are leaving the Earth's atmosphere as a result of photochemical dissociation of water. So it's going on now. Um, furthermore, um, the moons of Jupiter, Europa and Ganymede, they are known to have surface water. Now it's frozen, it's ice, but there'll be a little bit of water vapour in the atmosphere. And sure enough, uh, the atmospheres have been shown to have oxygen in them for both Europa and Ganymede. Recently, it's found that the rings of Saturn, they're largely composed of ice particles. And again, uh, photolysis of the water gives off oxygen. And it was recently discovered just this year that the rings of Saturn have an oxygen atmosphere uh, surrounding them. So even if the water is in the form of ice, it's still enough for the photochemical process to produce oxygen in the atmosphere. To my mind, it seems far more likely that the Earth's atmosphere has always contained a substantial amount of oxygen. Now, what about the uh, geological evidence then? Many textbooks state that uh, there are reduced rocks in the early Precambrian, or in the Precambrian, which are the earliest crustal rocks, uh, which show that the atmosphere was reducing, and they point, for example, to the... Uh, banded iron formations. Here's a banded iron formation in Australia. These are quite common in Precambrian, but they, occur, they occur in rocks of almost all geological ages. Not all geologists by any means accept this explanation because uh, deep waters in oceans and lakes are often 
very low in oxygen or oxygen free. So many geologists simply consider that these formations were laid down under deep waters where there was very little oxygen. If the atmosphere was reducing, or mainly carbon dioxide, we would expect the minerals that were laid down in Precambrian times to be significantly different from those that we see today. They wouldn't be all metal oxides, as I was telling you a minute ago. In fact, and I'm quoting from various geology textbooks here, Precambrian sedimentary and igneous rocks are lithologically rather similar to younger ones. So they have similar kinds of minerals and the chemical compositions are rather similar. Now weathering is a process that depends critically on the atmosphere. The extent of water in the atmosphere, the extent of oxygen in the atmosphere. If there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, weathering would take place in a completely different way. Mainly, weathering produces clays nowadays. Here's a bit of clay here. Yet clays are just as abundant in the Precambrian as in earlier rocks. It appears that erosion and sedimentation resemble modern processes. So there is really no evidence, no geological evidence or no compelling geological evidence for uh, a reducing or a, a practically neutral early atmosphere. Um, kerogen is graphitized carbon-containing matter that um, gets occluded into rocks. There's little, these little black bits here are the carbon material. It can have an organic origin or it can have an inorganic origin. If there had been a primordial soup rich in organic components, one would expect a lot of kerogen in Precambrian rocks. In fact, you would expect that the amount of kerogen in rocks would increase as you go back in time. In fact, exactly the reverse is the case. The further back in time you go, the smaller the amount of kerogen that's there. Um, what about fossil evidence of Precambrian life? Now, I've put up here a list of Precambrian rock groups. Here are the conventional ages here. Isoprenoids and porphyrins are generally reckoned to show that the organic matter they represent came from a living source. You can see that uh, isoprenoids are present right back to here, the Envoac group. Porphyrins right back to here. Microfossils. That's simple rods and spheres and, and filaments are present right back to here. Um, stromatolites. These are sort of mound-like structures made from algal mats. And they have this typical laminated structure. Here are modern ones growing at Shark Bay in Australia. Fossil ones can be detected right back to um, uh, here, the Bulawayan group. The oldest crustal rocks are supposed to be this Isua supergroup in Greenland. Here it is here. It's badly metamorphosed, the uh, Isua formation. So um, that means it's been modged up and generally altered and, and so on by geological processes. So uh, it's going to be very difficult to detect any microfossils or porphyrins or isoprenoids or anything like that. However, you can look at the kerogen. And uh, if kerogen is of biological origin, then it has a negative delta carbon-13. The carbon-13 fractionates in biological systems and gives you a negative value. Now, all these rock groups show these negative delta carbon-13 values, indicating that the kerogen is probably of biological origin. So it appears that life was present on the Earth from the earliest Precambrian. So there's not much time available for a random abiotic origin of life. The Earth is supposed to be about 4.5 billion years old. There must have been a long period, according to conventional theories, when it cooled and the crustal rocks formed. And then right from 3.8 billion years, life appears. Very little time in which it could have happened. So our time hypothesis looks even more unlikely. 
Returning to the RNA world, the, the fashionable area at the moment, we need nucleotides for the RNA world. That means uh, we need the sugar ribose and we need the bases adenine, thymine, cytosine, uracil. If you read Origin of Life textbooks, they usually quote this foremost reaction, starting with formaldehyde. Now, it's just conceivable that there might be some formaldehyde in the early atmosphere. If there was oxygen in the atmosphere, as I've suggested, that would go very quickly to formic acid, carbon dioxide and water. When the foremost reaction is carried out in a particular way, um, with a base, certain lead salts and certain catalysts, you get a mixture of sugars. Ribose accounts for about 7%. Under the best, the most favourable circumstances, about 7% ribose is formed under these conditions. The conditions don't look at all geologically plausible. You've got this great mixture as well. The ribose itself is easily hydrolyzed. If the atmosphere was carbon dioxide, that would dissolve in water to give you an acid C which would hydrolyze the ribose. It starts decomposing as soon as it forms. The textbooks say that the uh, bases, adenine, must have been formed from HCN. It's difficult to know how hydrogen cyanide could have been in the early atmosphere. If there was hydrogen cyanide in the early atmosphere, if, the oxygen, if there was oxygen there, it would quickly oxidize to nitric oxides, carbon dioxide and water. There is a so slow process which converts that into this chemical, and then on photolysis, you can get a little bit of adenine, about 1%. But you need very, very carefully controlled experiments to get this kind of a yield of adenine. There's no known source for the cytosine or uracil. Phosphate has to be activated if it's going to combine with our other chemicals there. No, uh, no way of doing this is really known. I mean, there are some suggested ways, of course, but none of these is geologically plausible. And phosphate is, is pretty insoluble because it combines with metal ions in the sea and precipitates to, to the bottom extremely readily. So again, phosphate is a big problem for the RNA world, just as ribose and the bases are a big problem. I've already referred to the stupendous odds against getting the, uh, the right sequence of nucleotides, even if we could get the basic materials for the nucleosides, the stupendous odds of trying to get the right sequences, which uh, there's no solution to that problem at the moment. Um, I think this is probably my last slide. Another problem is that um, the ribose, here's a picture of the ribose, it's got several reactive sites so this is the nucleotide that's needed here adenosine monophosphate to get that the base has to react here but there's nothing to stop it reacting here or here or here and in a random chemical situation it would react in all four places giving a complex mixture um, the same is true of the base itself it can react here here or here it doesn't have to act where we want it to act at that point there. Again, giving rise to a complex mixture. And I mean, another problem that I haven't referred to is the fact that uh, all these molecules have left and right handed uh, forms. And uh, in fact, this one has got one, two, three, four chiral centers giving rise to 16 different um, what are called stereoisomers. So we would get an enormous mixture of, uh, of nucleotides and not necessarily the, uh, not the one that, that's needed there. Very difficult problems to solve. You can prepare nucleotides in the lab. It's the chemist, highly intelligent. Application of, of um, intelligent scientific know-how you can overcome these problems that I've shown here and make these things, although, of course, they start degrading almost immediately and have to be stored under carefully controlled conditions. Once again, to me, this is evidence that intelligent design is needed in order to, uh, in order to get round these problems in the start of the origin of life. Now, what are, what are the conclusions then? 
Statistically, the chance of forming even one useful RNA sequence can be shown to be essentially zero in the lifetime of the Earth. The complexity of the first self-replicating system and the information needed to build it imply intelligent design. Hope of beating the colossal odds against random formation of replicating RNA is based on ideology rather than science. As lab experiments on model replicators become more complex, they demonstrate the need for input from intelligent minds, organic chemists. Acceptance of an early Earth atmosphere free of oxygen strains belief beyond breaking point, for me anyway. No chemically or geologically plausible routes to nucleotides or RNA strands have been developed. Geological fieldwork shows no support for a prebiotic soup. It favours little change in the atmosphere over time. Living things have been present since the first crustal rocks. We've had more than 50 years of sterile origin of life research. It's in time now to give intelligent design a fair hearing. Thank you all very much. Believe about origins is going to strongly influence how you relate to other people, how you lead your own life. People become very emotionally involved. It's difficult to stay cool. However, I've heard that it's said that education is the ability to listen to almost anything without losing your temper. I don't know if you agree with that, but we're just going to see this evening how well educated you all are. Now, there is some scientific controversy over exactly what is alive and what isn't alive. Most will agree, most scientists will agree that these characteristics that I put up here are typical of life. For example, there'll be organization. A living thing is composed of cells, one or more. The cells themselves are carefully organized, as we'll see in a minute. Metabolism. Consumption of energy by converting non-living material into cellular components. Adaptation, the ability to change over a period of time. Response to stimuli, that might mean contraction of a unicellular thing. Or motion, a bacterium moving along. Or a plant turning towards the sun, some kind of response then probably the most characteristic thing of life is reproduction. Living things reproduce themselves. Cells may divide to give you these areas. We as individuals, whether we have a scientific training or not, are perfectly entitled to either accept or reject their conclusions in this area. So I think it's a great pity when popular scientists, influential scientists like Richard Dawkins claim that those who reject the molecules to man scenario are ignorant, stupid, insane or wicked. I put on that slide where he made that quotate, quotation. Now many people have picked up on his views and uh, echo his remarks. Now, I'm one who does reject that molecules to man scenario. I do reject it. So you might be mentally sticking Dawkins' label on me, ignorant, stupid, etc., etc. That's why my next slide shows my qualifications in a bit more detail than I would normally do. You can see that I have two doctors. I'm not trying to boast here. I just want you to know I'm not ignorant, stupid or wicked. I've got two doctorates. I'm a professor of chemistry at St. Andrews University. I'm a chartered chemist and uh, I've been elected to fellowships of the Royal Society of Chemistry and the Royal Society right here in Edinburgh. Now, undoubtedly, I am ignorant of some things. I'm not a biologist, for example, but I can't be described as stupid or insane and I think I deserve a fair hearing. That's all I'm asked to. But usually the term is applied to the production of a new individual. Now that means viruses, and uh, there's an X-ray structure of a virus. 
They're not alive because they can't reproduce themselves without help from a host. On the other hand, bacteria, and here's some soil bacteria, are alive because they can reproduce themselves independently. Now, in the quest for origin of life, it's helpful to know what's the smallest living cell. What is the very smallest that's known? And, um, whoops, too far. Carsonella rudi was reported to be the smallest living cell. It has about 160,000 base pairs of DNA in its genome. However, this particular bacteria lives inside a leaf-munching insect called a psyllid. You can see that psyllid over there. And carcinella doesn't have quite enough enzymes to survive on its own. So it can't survive on reproduce on its own. So really the smallest living thing is this bacteria, Mycoplasma genitalium. It lives in the genital and respiratory tracts of primates. It's the smallest free living bacterium and it has a genome consisting of about 580,000 base pairs. Now that's quite a lot of base pairs, quite a lot really, in this evening a fair hearing. I agree with the Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, the physicist, when he said, I believe that a scientist looking at non-scientific problems is just as dumb as the next guy. Now we're thinking this evening about origin of life. What is life, first of all? Perhaps you might agree with Oscar Wilde that life is far too important a thing ever to sort, talk seriously about. In that case, we're all wasting our time coming here this evening and I'm wasting my time talking to you. Maybe it's all a mistake. But surely, when Lang says that life is a sexually transmitted disease, surely he's being far too pessimistic. Perhaps you see the force of Robert Heinlein's remark that the supreme irony of life is that hardly, one, hardly anyone gets out of it alive. True enough. <coughs> Pessimistic again, though, a much more optimistic note was struck by Job when he said, The Spirit of God has made me, the breath of the Almighty gives me life. And St. John, quoting the words of Jesus, said, I am the way, the truth and the life gives a much more optimistic slant to the whole business. Now the point that I'm trying to make here is that inevitably origin of life ideas have strong philosophical and religious implications. Whether you're an atheist, an agnostic, a Christian, whatever, what you believe I'd like to thank Paul very much for inviting me here and giving me the chance to talk to you all and thank you all for coming. I'd say that science is at its best when it's describing and rationalising how nature works. When objects and events from nature can be isolated, studied in the lab by experiments that are repeatable, then science does an excellent job. So when it comes to understanding how cells, the basic elements of life, work, how they work, then science is wonderful and it's made amazing progress and we understand and we all admire the work that the biochemists have done in, uh, in this area. But historical science is a completely different ballpark. When attempting to explain unique events from the past, that can't be taken into the laboratory, then the element of subjectivity becomes very large. Origin, event, origin events can't be studied in the laboratory. The models that are developed depend critically on the assumptions that go into them. And these are often strongly influenced by ideology. Science has no valid right to supremacy in these areas. Of course, we can listen to what the scientists have to say, but they have no automatic right to supremacy in